Hi, everyone. My name is Yuriko Otomo, for those of you who haven't met me, and as Director of the Global Research Network, I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. We're lucky to have some incredible women with us for our panel discussion on the future of academia. Usha Natarajan, Loveday Hodson, Anissa Abetia, and Anna Gria. And as we've also got Amaya Alvarez joining us from Chile. So uh, Usha is Said Fellow at Columbia University, Senior Fellow at Melbourne Law School, and the International Schuchlich Visiting Scholar at Dalhousie University. She was formally tenured at the American University in Cairo, and before that worked with the UNDP, UNESCO, and the World Bank. Her research is interdisciplinary, utilizing post-colonial and third world approaches to international law to provide an interrelated understanding of development, environment, migration, and conflict. She's won many awards and grants, and she's widely published, and serves as an editor on numerous journal boards. Love Day is an associate professor at Leicester University in the UK, and her research interests are primarily in international human rights law, gender, and sexuality. Today, with, uh, together with Troy Lavers, she's coordinated the Feminist International Judgments Project, which was published in 2019 as Feminist Judgments in International Law by Heart. She currently sits on the editorial board of Feminist Legal Studies, and she has a particular interest in research methods uh, with her edited volume, Research Methods for International Human Rights Law, uh, being published by Rutledge. That was last year. Anissa is a research and policy professional with a background in humanitarian diplomacy. So she's worked with US Congress, the Department of Homeland Security and the State Department to help shape US Syria policy with a focus on immigration. Anissa regularly presents published research in international fora, most recently at Cambridge. Anissa holds a master's from Stanford University in literary theory with a focus on post-colonial and feminist theory and she publishes poetry and policy briefs and academic articles. Anna is a professor at Cardiff University and she's the founder and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Human Rights and the Environment and founder until 2017 and director of the Global Network for the Study of Human Rights and the Environment, which is the largest existing international network of leading scholars in the field with activists, policymakers, lawyers and NGOs dedicated to the transformation of thinking concerning the relationship between human rights and the environment. Uh, Amaya Alvarez has a PhD in law from York University in Canada. She is an associate professor of law at the University of Concepcion in Chile. So she researches First Nations and the ancestral uses of water. She's also part of Redial, uh, which are new approaches to teaching international law in Latin America. As you can see, there's a really rich diversity of experience and expertise here, including what we and micro, migrant women in particular don't usually list in uh, their biographies. So juggling work and children, other family care obligations, moving constantly between their country of work and their country of origin, disability, struggling against social, racial and systemic bias. Before I hand over to them for their views on the future of academia, I'm going to give you a brief context for our discussion. So this summer has thrown a number of issues in stark relief. Uh, the Me Too movement has picked up pace with allegations coming, starting to come to light in academia. The Black Lives Matter movement has drawn attention to racism around the world, with Universities UK, for example, publishing last month uh, a damning report on systemic racism in higher education. COVID-19 has of course compounded the effects of all of these problems with migrant academics unable to return home, PhD students stuck on campus with no social support or, or family, um, and also being pressured to, to teach face-to-face -face in risky environments, others losing their jobs in what was already precarious and poorly paid work, and a dramatic reduction in workshops, conferences, and other networking opportunities. And yet, in many ways, the summer has also been a critical turning point for the better around the world because economic models are being reassessed. Discrimination is at the forefront of people's minds with serious efforts being made to decolonialize curricula and to stop the valorization of slave traders who have donated to universities and cities. 
PhD students who have managed to return home have found that universities in their own countries, some have been investing in, in research and developing capacity to teach their students in-house rather than sending them to study abroad. The mainstreaming of remote working has transformed opportunities for researchers with care obligations and disabilities and obstacles to getting visas, meaning that suddenly and dramatically, the playing field has been leveled. So what next? What's the future of teaching, research and publishing? What can we do to return the academy to some sense of public purpose? Uh, I'll hand over now to Usha for some comments. Thanks, Yuriko. Um, it's wonderful to be here amongst these fantastic people and uh, including some familiar faces in the audience. Lovely to, lovely to see you all. Um, so while some have been lamenting the loss of their routine comforts and longing for pre-pandemic times, for those who stood against the status quo for its environmental harm and violence structured on the basis of gender, class, race, sexuality, and disability, the mass disruption caused by the global pandemic prompts not a longing for this unjust past, but an opportunity for productive change. The challenges posed by the pandemic to academia are quite similar to other sectors. So amid this global economic downturn, we face budget cuts, job losses, unhealthy and exploitative labour practices, and this competition fueled race to the bottom that creates a precarious work with minimal benefits. And as always, the impact is disproportionately borne by women, by people of colour, by the poor, by people in the LGBTQI community and people who have disabilities. These exploitative, exploitative practices are long standing. And so the onset of a crisis provides a tactical moment to mobilise for institutional change. As academics, while the challenges we face are not dissimilar to other sectors, our calling does demand that we undertake fuller reflection and, and action, of course. And the action part is crucial. For instance, those in positions of power influence and influence have long known that the pandemic was coming, but were insufficiently prepared to help those who were most needy. And the same can be said about the proliferating crises precipitated by climate change by hyperbolic increases in inequality, by systemic racism and sexism and, and so on. We know now that wherever we live in the world, we can expect more natural disasters, more pandemics, more famine, drought, forest fires, more conflict, more mass displacement and more widespread human rights abuses. These aren't aberrant, they're not exceptions or emergencies, nor is it scaremongering or you know, apocalyptic science fiction to say this. Rather, this is the reality, and it's been playing out across the global south for several decades. Um, it is the predictable outcome of the greedy and irresponsible behaviour of privileged and powerful elites. And academics have the power to contextualise challenges within academia as the inevitable result of universities' long histories of complicity with racism, sexism and capitalism. So, we should rejoice that a return to the way things were is not only impossible, but entirely undesirable. And let us also rejoice that while violence against people and against the planet has solidified over many centuries, there is a parallel history of struggle against such violence that we can draw knowledge from and draw courage from and, and, and build on. And we know that those in positions of power and influence within universities and elsewhere often use so-called crises and emergency-based language as a cover for very rapid and harsh measures that they couldn't otherwise implement. And those opposing such power can also leverage this moment because we know that there will be other pandemics and other disruptions as our ecosystems degrade and collapse. So it is actually really unwise to assume that the economy will function as it always has um, and to continue pandering to its dictates. Um, the nature of economy and labour is in flux. And as more and more people start to realise this, we can unite to act outside the dictates of market competition and towards positive change. Um, of course, the pandemic does threaten to pit us against one another <laughs> in academia and in other sectors in, in the name of surviving. Um, but we can instead turn towards one another and refuse to play this game because most people can't win it. And even to win it no longer really makes any sense. Um, 
well before the pandemic, there was this public mistrust of university and suspicion of academic expertise building in society and communities all over the world. And academics can only rebuild this trust if we stop reproducing all the problems that we critique. And so when we you know, Me to the Black Lives Matter and climate justice movements, they show academia to be very much part of each of these problems. And so for early career academics who come from a position of disadvantage rather than privilege, this uncertain future can be fearful, but it is also really hopeful. And for the whole part to triumph over the fear part, I think the key is to build solidarity with like-minded people. Um, so, you know, that is to say your friends will give you hope and your allies will make you unafraid. And if you're an early career researcher and you are facing racism and sexism, if you're facing abuse, harassment or other types of discrimination, it can be really terrifying to speak up. But even if the only way to tell people what you're going through is to do so anonymously, if you do it, you will soon realize that you're not alone. Indeed, far from it, you're in the majority, sadly. And the privilege of the few is built on the foundation of the suffering of the masses. And because of this, there are more and more networks forming, transnational and interdisciplinary networks, precisely like, like this, like the GRN, um, to combat exploitative practices in academia and enable more fair and more accurate knowledge production. So, you know, I would say for an early career academic, it is crucial to connect with these groups to the extent that you can. Um, because together we will not only change the politics of knowledge production, but also help each other to combat these daily micro and macro aggressions in the academic workplace. Um, just to finish, I would just say most of my life has been in the global south where most universities deal with resource and infrastructure barriers at levels inconceivable <laughs> to academics in the global north. And in some places, the stakes are very high when it comes to discrimination, which doesn't just result in loss of a job, but can result in disappearance, torture, or death. And with the rise of fascism globally, those of us who are committed not only to, to knowledge, but to justice, have to unite to combat those, including those in academia, that actively enable these oppressive agendas um, you know, within their own countries or <laughs> elsewhere across the globe. And what makes me hopeful is that indeed we are uniting. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Yusha. There's so much to think about there. Uh, we're going to uh, maybe go through, um, I'll, I'll hand over to everyone to, to, to share their thoughts first, and then we can perhaps come together after that to have a discussion. So uh, love day. Thank you, Yuriko. Um, I, I have to confess, um, I was a little bit thrown by the incredibly kind and generous invitation to, to join you here today and to talk with you about the future of academia. I certainly don't have a crystal ball, of course, and I'm probably as anxious and as uncertain as the next person about what the future of academia holds. And I, I, I mean, I guess we're here sharing this experience today because the challenges that we face are undeniably daunting and I've been around the block long enough now to have witnessed considerable changes in academia in the UK which is the context in which I, I've worked um, and Eureka was perhaps quite upbeat about the opportunities that Covid has offered the kind of the potential leveling that we've seen but I think we can, we can perhaps also acknowledge that COVID has accelerated many of the changes that were taking place within academia anyway. So I think that's something to sound a note of caution about. Precarity and casualization are increasingly common um, within UK academia as the purpose of higher education is reduced to filling seats and delivering to students specified hours of contact. Consequently, the relationship between students and universities has become increasingly strained with students facing a neoliberal model of university education and the huge burden of debt that model places on their shoulders, responding to that model's logic with an increasingly consumerist language. Research opportunities are limited and efforts, research efforts corralled towards the ubiquitous REF assessment exercise, which narrows the parameters of the value within our work. 
racism and sexism arrive presenting seemingly entrenched problems and we have barely begun to have serious conversations about disablism in academia. And one thing is certain when we contemplate the future of academia, we won't all share the same experiences or bear, bear the same burdens in the future university. At present, mar marginalization will increase. So for many of us, the question will be, how do we survive the next chapter of academia? And how might we work towards shaping its future, which I don't take to be an inevitable uh, inevitability that we don't have any um, contribution to make. And um, also how to work with the privilege that we, that we have within academia. I propose collaboration today as a key to both survival and transformation in the future university. Thinking about research then, market logic that um, currently demands the commodification of knowledge production, researching collaboratively challenges the emphasis on and rewarding of individualism in academia. And I think this is a powerful, potentially powerful tool. There is in contemporary academia, particularly in the arts and social sciences, a belittling of collaborative work, not least because of the weakness and dependency that it seems to imply and the necessity of declaring ownership over that knowledge. From my own experience, the opportunity to work collaboratively has always generated enthusiasm and a particular dynamic and energy that points towards the potential for transformation. Collaboration offers an alternative to the normal isolation of academic work. And from a feminist perspective, which as Eureka um, kindly in her introduction identified as being the position from which I work, uh, working collaboratively challenges the hierarchical nature of academia that tends to foster isolation, divide us rather than unite us, and focuses its attention on individual achievement. Even senior academics tend to become isolated by academic hierarchy, for instance, at conferences, invited to give keynotes and attend meals in the old former COVID times as organisers. Importantly, however, I'm referring to collaboration with a shared tra transformative purpose. Collaboration in and of itself, of course, is not inherently transformative. So in this context, creating a space for collaboration and mutual support for those swimming against the academic stream is a political act. And perhaps we might describe this as the hope that together we might make sufficient noise to become impossible to ignore. So I'm suggesting that collaboration then is essential for our own survival and um, for our efforts to shape the future of academia. It's a collaboration is a useful tool to combat the loneliness and frustration that outsider researchers, a space that many of us feel that we occupy can experience. Collaboration draws strength, not from drawing from one single strand of thought and one struggle for change, but from drawing from a range of possibilities to achieve shared goals. The importance of working across difference rather than professing blindness to difference is stressed throughout the work of Audre Lorde, who in the uses of anger argues that the strength of women lies in recognizing differences between us as creative and in standing up to those distortions which we inherited without blame, but which are now ours to alter. So this is a collaboration for the purpose of shaping the future of academia. It's an, this collaboration is an intersectional one where the different relations we have to power structures, the power structures of academia are acknowledged. In my utopia, the non-hierarchical nature of this collaboration is, is its essence. In the future university, for instance, students must be, re must be returned some sense of ownership over their education. Early career researchers must feel valued and be nurtured and not anxious about how bills will be paid. So in the unionization is an essential part of this um, process. From the, think from the perspective of those who don't enjoy the privilege that full-time academics have, the relevance of collaboration may not be immediately obvious. Certainly you will receive the message implicitly or explicitly as legal researchers that individual publication and achievement is the goal to aim for. But my experience suggests that in this difficult climate that we're currently facing, collaboration and support are key to flourishing. Finding your people is a crucial part of survival. 
writing alone as a legal academic is undoubtedly a privilege, but perhaps one in its solitariness that can serve to disconnect us from the ideas, priorities and concerns that will really transform the future of academia. Working collaboratively is certainly one of the highlights of academic work. And I think there is a time and a place, of course, for lone reflection in, in epistemology that centers collaboration. But I hope I've raised some issues with respect to the potential importance of collaboration in the vital ongoing process of charting the future of academia. Thanks, Eureka. Well, thank you so much, Love Day, and I, I hope we get to hear some examples of your collaborative work later on. Uh, for me too, it's been it's been really the highlight of of being in academia. Uh, I'll next hand over to Anissa. Thank you, well, thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you Rico, for the inv invitation and uh, the ability to speak on this panel with such um, innovative and uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, currently, I'm a student at the University of San Francisco in migration. So not only am I, am I going to discuss uh, how the future of academia impacts mid-career academics, but also students, uh, graduate students, and you know, even undergraduate students and high school students, the, the entire educational system has been disrupted. Yes, a COVID has provided opportunities and it's, it's a, there's a potential for dramatic change. But on the other hand, COVID has highlighted the discrepancies existing within the United States. Um, we don't, we, our, our education here isn't free. When we attend university at any level, you have to pay or take out loans. So for us here, beyond race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, it's, it's a class issue. Um, there's a meme that's been going around that says, we're not all in the same boat. Some people are in yachts, others are in sailboats. Some people are in paddle boats, other people are drowning. We're in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat together. Women in particular, there's been a few articles um, that have been circulating around that women aren't submitting journal articles at the same rate that they were before. Because women, not only do they have their work in that, at, at home, but in academia as well with, with childcare, they don't have the time. COVID has really, reduce women's time from being able to research and to write and collaborate and produce. Uh, from another perspective, a lot of students are dropping out of school because they can't afford to pay tuition. And tuition really hasn't been reduced significantly. The administration of the universities in the United States uh, are, are paid tremendous amounts of money they haven't really taken significant pay cuts. And the tuition uh, just for my institution for one semester for one semester is over $10,000. So if you're in a master's program, if you're in a PhD program, uh, not only do you have to worry about how you're going to pay for school, but how you're going to live. So when you think about projecting into the future, what about the students right now who are in elementary school? They don't have, if they don't have access to uh, technology, they don't have, have access to a laptop, to a computer, if their parents aren't privileged enough to be able to stay at home with them, who are gonna be our future academics? We are going to, in the current situation we're in, we're going to be limiting our pool of applicants to people who are wealthy, and to people who are able to have access to resources that we, just the majority of Americans don't have. If we don't have a dramatic policy shift, if we don't have a dramatic shift within academia itself to provide not only resources, but things like food to students. Right now, um, places like Berkeley and Harvard have, um, eliminated certain programs. Next year, Berkeley isn't going to be uh, admitting uh, PhD students into the sociology, uh, anthropology, and some other disciplines 
some universities are doing away with complete with departments. So looking at these, these budget cuts that are occurring here in, in the US, uh, students who are already living precariously, who are significantly in debt, this is a trend that if it's if we don't address it is only going to exacerbate the gross inequities students face here already. It's going to limit the diversity that we're now finally seeing within within different departments. So for for here for us here in the United States, if there isn't a concerted effort on all whether between students faculty, staff, and administration to, to change this, this is going to be the future of academia. We're going to go backwards. We're going to see a reduction in, 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 in diversity and a reduction in who's, not only whose voices are heard, but particularly in what departments have value. Who are, who, what departments are going to be bringing in money what department and what departments that don't bring in money are going to be cut as we were already we're already seeing. And this is this is not a good sign. But from a more positive perspective, uh, the inequities are really being highlighted now. We, it's just plain to everybody to see who are the populations that are being hit hardest. We cannot say now as a, from an academic perspective or even a human perspective that we don't know. We don't know that these issues are happening. We know they're happening. And there's things that, that we can do going forward. And what, what, I, what I see, um, one of the huge potentials of GRN is the ability to connect people all over the world. So for me, I, the, three, the three concepts that I look at is, is to connect, to intersect and disrupt. Uh, organizations like GRN can connect academics all over the world uh, to start discussing what are the same underlying issues as, as Usha had, had touched upon. The issues right now that um, the North and the South are facing are becoming similar, especially in the United States because we, we don't have COVID relief, because students uh, have to pay for their school. There's these overlapping of, of crises. We're experiencing these crises all over the world. So how can we come together as a global community to address these issues? And I really believe GRN has a, a huge potential to be able to be able to start connecting people, academics, uh, government organizations, governments, local populations, and to start thinking creatively about how, how can we address these issues? What are, what's going to, because what works in one place may not work in the other, but just identifying here are the problems. How can we find these solutions? Uh, the, other, the other point is to intersect. Uh, as Lovdia had, had mentioned, it is just the intersectionality between our multiple disciplines. We are all from different disciplines, but we all have something to contribute from our discipline to these issues. And, Academia, see, you really compartmentalize what you know. This is this discipline. This is that discipline, and we hardly ever intersect. It, one because you you just can't get the funding for it, because it, you know it's a specific discipline in a specific country in a specific locality. What COVID has shown is that that, that doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter really where your location is, uh, or what your discipline is. We're all being affected by these issues and it's going to take a concerted effort to do that and then lastly to disrupt we cannot go back to the way things were we have to disrupt the way in which policy is crafted which policy is implemented the way we think of policy we, we, we have to have not only local populations that are being affected say, say as students they are human beings academics were human beings and I, I think we forget that and our voices, we are experts in, in, in our fields. It behooves us at this time to approach policymakers and offer our services. Right now, I'm drafting a, a letter to Javier Becerra, who was recently named the head of Health and Human Services here in the United States, because my work on integration with uh, refugee populations it is very much in line with, with 
how do we integrate different populations into our society? Right now in the United States, we're in such a huge crisis. Here within Los Angeles, where I live, the amount of people that are going without food, the rise of homelessness. So bringing my research to a government agency and saying, look, this is what I've been doing. I think it can help. So even just doing things like that, approaching whoever your, your local representative is and saying, I'm an expert in this field. I have an idea. May I share it with you? So it's also going to take the initiative of academia to really come out of their academic bubbles and to offer our opinions, our ideas, and also our students' ideas, because they, they as well have, have wonderful insights into how we can solve these students, how we can solve the dilemmas that we are facing today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anissa. Uh, there's, there's a lot to think about there. And uh, I hope to hear actually from the panel and the audience later on um, if, if there are still countries out there who do provide free university education. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear, hear more of your thoughts on that too, Anissa, as to how we could lobby collectively uh, to, to, change, to change the tide on this. Okay, I'd, I'd next um, like to call on Amaya to share her thoughts. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning. I hear it's very early in the morning. I, I appreciate the invitation. I apologize because I, I was a little messy <laughs> with emails and everything. It's, it's the other side of the world. Here is summer, we're still in exams. Um, so it's kind of sometimes hard to organize everything. I, I appreciate those academics who uh, talked before me. I wanted to give you some uh, examples of how we deal with this in Latin America. I have um, a group of colleagues and friends called Redial, which is rethinking international law, teaching international law in Latin America. And we have this conviction that education can have a transformative power and can have an emancipatory capacity. Where, but as academics, we find many walls to deal with this in the sense that academia is very hierarchical. I'm not sure if everywhere, I can't speak for the whole world, but what I see in Latin America is if you're a, whim, a woman and if you are young, oh, I, I, I want to believe that I'm still young, uh, it's really hard to make changes. You've seen, I mean, if you come to academia and you have new ideas, I was lucky enough to do my PhD in Canada. So when I came back, I had this whole range of beautiful emancipatory ideas. And my boss thought that it was rubbish, that it, I was crazy and that I needed to do as expected. And that was really hard. And then what I thought, what I did at the end was what Usha just told us at the beginning, is to look for other people that think similarly, because it's not the same to say, I will do it because I think it's, it's a great idea. Then if you say, you know what, we have been thinking about this, this whole range of academics from this whole very different uh, positions and places and really like solidarity in academia and to kind of stand behind an idea that is shared by kind, nice, uh, caring people is so different. I, I always do it. You know what's not my idea, it's Redial idea, it's EGLP, it's my, my colleagues from Canada, it's this indigenous legal traditions uh, group. And I don't, it feels so much safe in a way. So that will be a first thing to say, like look for the people, like, but create something that will unite you and kind of put yourself behind that shield in a way. On the other hand, I thought that COVID, as bad as it has been here in the South, did a good thing. I don't know if you will share this with me. It, will, it gave us a more democratic place to work from because everyone is the same behind this camera. You know, it, it, it kind of 
And this kind of thing that when I come to a meeting, when I come to a seminar, if you're a woman in Latin America, you are immediately in a, in a, in a position like lower. I mean, your voice will be less heard because you talk not as loud or you don't uh, use as much space. And with the camera, it, it makes all of us more or less equal. I don't know if, if you saw the same about that. And I live in a region, I live in the indigenous ancestral land of the Mapuche people. And money was all, always an issue to invite me to seminars. And now I have three, three seminars per day, it's crazy because there is no more money involved in it. Only like an internet connection, which mine is very bad, as you can see. Um, but connectivity became an issue, but all the rest was more or less erased, which was good. Um, and the body thing, I don't know. I mean, you're all female scholars. I don't know if you, if you saw that, the way you look, the way you talk, the way you use the space is not any more as relevant as it, as it was before. I always wanted, and, and I don't want to take as much space, but just to finish, um, I'm not sure if those who work in the global north are as aware how, how hard it is for us to take part in a global conversation, not only because of a language issue, I speak English, but I'm, I'm maybe the 1% and I'm, I'm not a native speaker. And for so many people, they only speak what we speak in Latin America, which is Portuguese or Spanish or their indigenous languages. So to take part in a global conversation is almost impossible. I mean, the language barrier is really hard. And on the other hand, um, I don't know if for you it's the same, we have research projects but we need to make um, some very high index publication, which are all in English. And then we write for those because we need that to survive as researchers. But then you don't speak to your own people. For example, I, I write about indigenous legal traditions for the Mapuche people in a beautiful journal like sustainability in English and I needed to write another version of it in Spanish and another version of it in Mapusungun so people can read what I just wrote. So it's triple work. I don't know. I, I'm writing about um, rivers in Latin America, how rivers can have legal personhood. And it takes forever because I need to research it in Spanish, write it in English, translate it back in Spanish, give it to... so. I don't know if you're fully aware of how hard it is to do research in the South because we need to fulfill parameters of the North to be heard. Um, yeah, I think I leave it there, right there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amaya. That, that's a, such a valuable perspective. Um, and I should point out that uh, this is a very Eurocentric meeting in the sense that we're in a time zone that's very easy for us. And I realize that uh, Anissa, Amaya, Usha, you're in time zones that um, mean that you're up in the in the middle of the night uh, talking to us. So thank you so much for, for making that time. Um, as much as Zoom has had this sort of flattening effect to make it all possible for us to attend things. Um, I mean, I too have I haven't been as brave as you. I tend to turn things down if they're at three in the morning. <laughs> and, and so it's not always possible. Um, yes, so there's so many um, important things that we need to pick up from what you've mentioned. And I know that uh, as, as well as um, researchers in non-English speaking countries having to publish in English and that being a pressure and a, a, a lot of additional work, there are countries where people just don't publish in English because they they can't. And so that really valuable work never gets sort of translated into an international domain. And so, of course, this kind of dominance of, of English as, a, as an academic lingua franca has to be addressed. Um, at, at the Global Research Network, we are setting up a Spanish language stream. So hope, and we're hoping to, to do this with other, you know, um, widely used languages in the future. So, yeah, uh, please, please watch this space. 
Um, I'd like to finally call on Anna to share her thoughts. Thank you. Okay, I finally got off mute. Um, and I'm just going to find my notes, um, which seem to have disappeared. Um, I just wanted to say before I start how humbled I am to be with such amazing women and every single contribution I've heard so far is just really thought provoking and engaging in terms of the profound political insights and questions of power freighted through each contribution um, has been truly provocative um, and I just want to say how much I value and honour that and how um, honoured I feel to be part of this group. So the framing of our discussion today overtly locates our conversation against the impacts of COVID-19 um, and that's come up frequently and we're framing it in part as a compounding dynamic intensifying pre-existing hierarchies. So COVID-19 is thus framed as a multiplier, an exposition, a critical agent that strips back yet again the pre-existing logics and fault lines of hierarchized precarity, including the hierarchies of precarity now haunting the university sector. For a long time now, universities have been subjected to and have also operationalized neoliberal entrepreneurialism and intensifying levels of managerialism. And these have facilitated and imposed, as is well known, market-driven rules and forms of competition. The public character of higher education has mutated beneath a barrage of market imperatives. Universities have turned into large neoliberal global corporate enterprises competing in a global market for international students. Dynamics hit hard by COVID-19. And the corporate university is the pivotal expression of academic neoliberalism has reconstructed its working conditions along classically neoliberal lines. Precarity, as we know, is intensifying as workloads spiral, casualization spreads and academics are forced increasingly to market themselves against a background of rising job losses and the rapid proliferation of an academic gig economy. Meanwhile, university managers now dominating higher education evince a restless commitment to constant change while simultaneously multiplying forms of accountability pressed on overburdened staff members. In the UK, that's REF, TEF, student satisfaction surveys, and so on. And then there are new workload management systems that never quite capture the spiraling unaccounted for workload rise as academics, apparently more than any other professional sector, report with rising rates of stress and mental illness. Knowledge and scholarship, meanwhile, are reconstituted as consumables for a competition-based corporate industry, pitting academics against each other in struggles for ever dwindling sources of funding. Students are reconstructed as consumers. Degrees are reduced to mere vocational entry cards into this wider neoliberal economy. And all these dynamics, as we all know, and as criti critical scholarship demonstrates, feed on deeply neo-colonial assumptions underlying the construction of neoliberal knowledge and power. If it is meaningful, as I think it is, to read COVID-19 as an intensifier of pre-existing logics and hierarchies, as a kind of exposure, perhaps even a kind of becoming pandemic of long-standing colonizing patterns of unevenness and of the production of hierarchies of precarity by Eurocentric academia itself, then perhaps we can also take inspiration from COVID-19 as a kind of viral swarming. And we've been talking about it in a way, it's been implicit in some of the conversation thus far. Perhaps there are new forms of solidarity, new forms of creativity, different kinds of connection to be found and deployed by us as part of a viral digital community of necessary reinvention. Perhaps it's possible to form new digital solidarities that address the impact of the intensifications characterizing the working conditions of universities. While digitalization certainly presents dangers in the blurring of work boundaries, the temporal spread of work into entire spans of days and weekends, the pressure to be constantly available, always on, always there for students as some kind of 
digital sleepless avatar endlessly meeting demand, the increased capacities of employers to surveil our work practices, the pressure to have a social media profile and so on and so on. While all of those represent dangers, are there not also new forms of inventive solidarity and swarming made available precisely by these digital technologies themselves? Is it possible then that COVID-19 as an exposure invites new solidarities dedicated to the importance of passing through the membranes of unevenness to produce a kind of wildish collectivity and new forms of imagined partnership? Can we break, for example, through the membranous borders between fixed term and casualized staff members? Can we break through the membranous racialized borders constructed in and by academia without, in that process, privileging white anxiety or guilt? Can we cultivate new digitally viral cross-community cross cultures of resistance, mutualization and support? Can we co-inhabit networked digital webs of injustice sensitive decolonial sensibility and praxis specifically for academia and perhaps in renewing forms of pedagogic justice? It seems to me that what Yoriko is doing with this non-aligned global research network and the important conversations it's facilitating like the one today is precisely that kind of work sparking spaces of swarming for new alliances in search of better ways of resisting and perhaps even escaping to a degree the imperatives of academic capitalism. This could include the co-genesis of practical ways, and perhaps we can explore this in conversation, of assisting early career researchers out of a sense of marginalization into newly forged communities and creative solidarities. I actually have no real idea yet what that might mean, but surely the whole point of, of a politics of viral swarming is that the swarm itself produces an emergence, an emergent collective mutable assemblage of insights and imagination, new forms of viral inspiration. So perhaps this conversation is just one buzzing line of flight in something altogether more expansive over time, something that might might hold out hope of shifting academic life back in the direction of a meaningful, participatory, inclusive workplace democracy, one vital, in fact, to democratization more generally, one fundamental, in fact, to questioning and resisting the accretion of elite power, which in some ways has been intensified with the arrival of the pandemic. Those are my humble thoughts. Thank you so much, Anna. What a beautiful talk. Um, I think following on from, from your invitation to, to become a swarming, I'd like to call on the panelists now to maybe um, have a discussion all together about some of the ideas that have been raised. I mean, I for one would love to hear some examples of collaborative work that you've done, radically transformative work that you've done, ways in which you are all engaging with junior um, colleagues to support them in their work. So over to you all. Uh, please just jump in. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to <laughs> jump in and say that was a terrific way to end on the swarming note. I was just thinking that I'm part of a network called TWAIL, a, a movement of international law scholars and practitioners that work on post-colonial issues. And whenever we meet, we always, you know, call it, call ourselves co-conspirators <laughs> or, you know, wonder what it is that we are. But next time I'm going to say we're a swarm. <laughs> <laughs> so I really like that analogy. Um, I would say one of the things that Amaya, of course, knows about that is important to do is to create new ways of, of knowledge production um, and to say, well, if I'm going to write something, then, and, and in any case, in many of our fields, we either write for free or have to pay to be published in some fields, um, then in that case, you know, take some of the control into your own hands. You are in, in case performing uh, the labor yourself and say, well, I'm not going to publish in places that are inaccessible to most people. 
um, and you know that I'm not going to um, that that I'm going to make an effort to include those people who are kept out of other journals because of the way they write or the language they write in. Um, and those things are really hard to do because we're encouraged to do the opposite. But what I like about the current moment is that, unfortunately, when people are pushed to the point where they have very little left to lose, then we are willing to make sacrifices and are less afraid. And so more and more people are doing these things because, yes, you're threatened with job loss, but that might be coming anyway. So you might as well do things and you know work with something that you you believe in and that the reason why we're doing this work in the first place um and i think that we have to accept unfortunately that if we're going to push against existing structures there will be pushbacks there's no way of getting around the fact that you have to be prepared for pushback and for some sacrifice there's no other way to push for change and the one way to cope with that is to have these alliances because it's not going to be easy and that can help, you know, temper what it is that you face a little bit, but you're still going to face stuff, you know, you have to be ready to deal with that. Um, and there's, you know, not all of the things that each of us has mentioned, solidarity doesn't mean that those things are going to be achieved without sacrifice. It just means that that's going to be easier to bear. Um, so, you know, we've started a journal in Twail that is geared towards bringing in people from all over the world that wouldn't otherwise be heard and to make it open access and to make it a non-hierarchical process and to think about who these publishers are and what languages we use and all of that. And it actually, Amaya's um, network, Red Gale, has been a really important part of us learning from them about things we need to do in terms of translation and language. And, you know, the reason why I think it's important is not just because uh, you know, it's it's not fair if we don't hear from you know most of the world, but also because we we need to the problems we face we don't have solutions to most of them. So if we're not actually open to these voices, we're just going to be stuck in this echo chamber of increasing irrelevance. That's why nobody trusts academics, uh, you know. And we just speak to each other, and even those of us who are super critical, we're just there to make people feel better about themselves that they're in some way progressive, but not to actually countenance real change. Um, so, I mean, unless we, you know, break open some of these barriers, then, you know, we're just tuning ourselves to increased irrelevance. And as, as uh, Anisa was saying, you know, who are these future academics going to be? They're going to become more and more of an echo chamber, <laughs> you know. Um, so there, there are strong incentives um, for change now. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> One thing that really strikes me in this conversation is the way in which we've been identifying this increasing atomization and linearity almost within academia, the way that everything's set up and individualized. Um, and that to me seems increasingly plausible, even at an empirical level, when you think about the most cutting edge thinking that's going on across the humanities and sciences is taking us in exactly the opposite direction is taking us into emergence, complexity, co-generative um, assemblages of multiple layers of um, affect all coming together and the importance of radical diversity in terms of just the sheer health of generativity. Um, and I just think there's some conversation to be had there about the role of academics in learning from a pluriverse of epistemological positions of diversifying and decolonizing academic methodology itself. Um, because it, it seems to me that most academic methodology is intrinsically based on Eurocentric assumptions about how the world operates. And that's something that's really come through for me in this in this conversation, just listening. Um, and I feel very provoked as the um, editor in chief of the Journal of Human Rights and Environment, because that's an English language journal. Uh, we do work very hard to help non-English language speakers into the journal, and the journal is given free in developing nations. There's, there's no charge for having the journal, which, you know, we, we pushed Elga, which is not an open access publisher, to do that. But what I'd like to think about, and maybe this is something that GRN and um, 
other groups might be interested in, is actually finding ways to translate the journal into other languages and make it accessible um, to, to other languages as well, as well as helping you know, non-English speakers into the journal. I think translation uh, could be a really important thing. And that certainly provoked me to go away and think about how we do that. But we do actively work with early career researchers in the journal in particular to give them a foothold and a, a way in. And we try and um, support early career researchers in developing their publication trajectory in that way. But I think there's more that we could do listening to this conversation. I think, you know, echo what, what, what Urshan said. We, re we have been reproducing in our academic research this, we've been, we're actually inflicting uh, our research on our research participants. We're recreating, and this is why people don't trust academics, particularly in the social sciences because of the, the, the recreation of, of, of this, this violence against indigenous people, against women. They don't see any benefit from our research. We take our research and we package it into language they can't understand, that they can't access. So I think one of the things that academics need to do is, is to start writing in different forms not just for academics, but for lay people as well. I, I have degrees, I have master's degrees, both in sciences and the humanities. And one of the things that I do is I, I write for larger audiences so that they know what I'm doing. And also from a, you know, an individual perspective, how, how, are, how are we thinking about our research? What are the theories? How, how, what are the methods that we're utilizing? And this is why I had uh, approached ERN to uh, highlight the, uh, a book talk by Colette and uh, two researchers in, from the University of, one from the University of San Francisco, who uh, disrupt our normal notions of research. Uh, their book is titled The Academic Activists. So looking at research, not just as, okay, I'm going to go into a place and see what's going on. Well. How are you benefiting that population? How are you bringing value to that population? So that, that's essentially what, what that book looks at and the institution that I'm at and migration studies. I chose migration studies because it's a disciplinary, it, because it allows me to pick from multiple disciplines, because it allows me to place refugees, marginalized people front and center to start to draft people-centered policy that look at it and look at what do people really need? What do they want? What are they asking for? And when I go to conferences, I'm, I'm so shocked when people come up and say like, oh, that was quite novel that you went out and you actually asked refugees what they wanted and how these policies affected their lives, which for, for me, that's the only approach, the only approach I would find valid when you're working with these types of populations. So not only, you know, yes, publishing in open access um, journals, but also writing in a way that the general population can understand you, uh, giving respect uh, and, um, and looking at your research participants as co-creators of knowledge and looking at your research as an impetus and catalyst for change. And I really believe that will go a long way and so it really is a, a disruption of the way academics come to the, come to and approach the research. And this is the you know, GRN, this is what you know, we're starting to do. Uh, and hopefully as we grow and as we start to embark on projects together, we'll be able to do this. So January 20, 28th, if you're interested, that's when this book talk is gonna happen, the academic activist. So hopefully you'll, you'll bring these tools as well on how to do these things because people are, people are innovative and creative all over the world, but when we're not able to connect to them because of it, we've never heard of them. Um, hopefully this is something German can, can bring to the table. Uh, thanks, know. Anissa. Sorry. Yeah. Can I just Sorry. jump in here, Eureka? Is that okay? Please do, yeah. And um, then, and then, um, Amaya, I'll, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Amaya. I was sleepy. I'll 
uh, is it okay to carry on? Um, I don't, I was just, I was actually going to say that I was just so in awe of the contributions that are in terms of the um, discussion about the, the direction that we might take. I th I'm not sure that I have uh, a, a great deal to add, apart from to, I guess, acknowledge the the strains that this causes to our to in within our personal lives as well that this the challenges that it presents and just to acknowledge that we are swimming swimming against the tide here in um the the compelling arguments that are being made for doing academia differently do then come bring with them a, a personal toll and which is um which i think is worth acknowledging at least and to to consider how, how we support one another, um, and like I said, and, and as I said, in to, to tried to say in my talk, we're, we're not all sharing burdens in the same way, um, and it, it's painfully obvious in in UK academia that that some people are uh, are almost crushed at present by the burdens of trying to do things differently. So, um, and even even just to survive in academia, I was wondering. I'm not sure if now is the time, but I was wondering as well. I would love to hear I don't, um, people's thoughts about. The, the teaching aspect of academia as well and how that's been the challenges that that's presented and the kind of changes that people might see see on the horizons because I, I just certainly didn't give enough thought to that in my talk and I would love to to hear about this I think we've got some in some ways energized students certainly we're seeing in Manchester in the north in of England we're seeing some really interesting student activism, rent strikes happening. And I think in some ways there, there I may see some potential in, in what may happen in terms of change in academia. The, I know online teaching, I would say has been a mixed bag um, in terms of some of the opportunities that we, we've mentioned today, but also some of the challenges. Um, I just, yeah, so I, I just open up the question really more than anything and see if anyone has any thoughts about the teaching side of things. Thanks, love. It'll be great to come to that. Um, maybe can I first ask Amaya for her thoughts? I think she wanted to respond mm. to Anissa. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking, um, and I, I made it as a question, but I have been lately thinking about the, where the money to do research comes from. Uh, so, sorry to kind of go to a side uh, question, but mm -hmm. um, for example, in Chile, where I work now, um, there is a limited budget. I mean, universities are kind of poor institutions. They are beautiful, they are big, but they are not. They do not have much money to do research. So you need to apply for research, and many times the funding will come from private institutions. And I'm becoming more and more concerned about this idea of private donors, but they will ask for a retribution. And sometimes I found out that they will own the results of your research. So if they don't like your research, mm -hmm. they will hide it like under a carpet and all your work will disappear. I mean, that happened with one, I was like, what, what happened with that final uh, kind of uh, research uh, information? No, no, we, we are waiting, we are waiting. <laughs> and they waited actually forever. So I was thinking, um, we need to kind of come up with a system that if a private or a public institution do a donation for research, it will come to a kind of a blind uh, space where you can have that money, but it doesn't mean that you will need to follow their guidelines. I think that's unfair. And in a way, what Anisa was saying is so relevant. We need to do an impact on the poor, on the, on the, on the people who really need it. On, on indigenous people and with indigenous people, I have a bigger problem because I do think they need to give their consent to publish whatever we found. And if, if they don't want it to be published because they know sometimes when we publish things about indigenous people, at the end of the day, we empower those who wanna kind of uh, take advantage or colonize them again. You know, colonization in Latin America works through mining companies that come from Canada 
or from other parts of the global north. So if you publish in English in a very beautiful journal and you think you're doing the world kind of, uh, you, you need the world's gratitude for your publication, most probably you will be empower, empowering a mining company that will come to Chile and will know exactly what to do. Can I, can I come in in response to um, Amaya and Anissa? Because I, I think this is really interesting because I was listening, when I was listening to Anissa, I was thinking, yeah, but there is a place for advanced theorization and the kind of theoretically nuanced sort of work that doesn't immediately have a, an appeal to the wider public, but gets translated by other scholars into forms that then trickle down and engage with different dynamics. And I was thinking, while you know, while it's absolutely essential to do what you were saying, Anissa, and what you're, you know, to have the suspicions that you're bringing into that frame, Amaya, I think is critical because how do we, how do we make sure that our research has real world meaning and engages with real world problems and actually responds to the en energies and the um, forms of emergent praxis that we need to respond to without falling into the neoliberal impact agenda? Um, and that's a real problem. And I, I really rebel against the impact agenda. I, I think there is a place for scholarship that is just blue skies pushing the boundaries of human possibility. No possible practical impact in mind, because who knows, in 15 years time, something in that research could change a whole paradigm. So this, this question, this political question, how we navigate the vital things that you're saying, Anissa, about not abusing research participants, ensuring that there's genuine empowerment and engagement that comes from them that is you know, pluriversal and all the rest of it. And treading this careful line that Amaya has so importantly brought up with privatized research, but not just private, privately funded research, publicly funded, government-led, neoliberal university corporate institution research. It's a huge, area that we need to, I think, probably explore and unpack. Not necessarily now, obviously. You know, I really think that the, there has to be a balance, Anna, where we're doing too much research for research sake. And it's not, especially in the social sciences, where it's not benefiting the local populations, where it's actually harming them. And one of one of one of the one of the things that you know my institution push, pushes all the time is just because you're doing research, it doesn't mean that you have to mm -hmm. release all of the information. Uh, and even even the, the 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 two people, the two scholars, are bringing are saying they don't publish some of the research because that wasn't the focus. So yes, of course, in academia, there's also always room for for research. Uh, that's just, you know, or a theory, that's, but that's a very specialized field where right now as, as academics, we are really not doing a good job engaging general population, and at least in the United States here, this is how we get presidents like Donald Trump. Yeah, I hear that entirely, and I, I have yeah. to confess my own positionality. I'm a theorist. I believe that theory at its best with bell hooks is a form of healing, and so I have no issue with doing theoretical research, but I wouldn't want everyone to be doing what I do because I think that's, you know, we all have our own specialisms and our own role to play and what you're saying is absolutely essential. I'm also a theorist. That's what my, my bachelor's and my, my master's in Stanford's at. So, but then working in policy side, I see really the, the need of academics to be able to articulate their theories and their ideas into ways that policymakers can, mm -hmm. can use. Not everyone can do that. I think that's a collective endeavor though. I don't think mm -hmm. every single theorist needs to do that. I think, yes, theory absolutely needs translation, but I don't think the theorist themselves necessarily has to be the person to do it. I think this is about, this is about collective endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, and there are sort of high, there are theorists who are very abstract. There are theorists who you might think of as mid-level theorists. And then there are people who are much, much closer to empirical and you know, qualitative analysis and, and all of that stuff. And I think it is a collective endeavor. But I take on, I absolutely take on what you're saying. I wonder if I might jump in to, um, you know, whether, whether they are so mutually exclusive, Anna, 
um, I tend to think that, that the most beautiful writing in, in theory, in philosophy, in, in history, in literature, is, is deeply personal. Uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to study under Lu the French feminist philosopher Lucy Rigorai, and she said, you know, you start with yourself, you begin, begin right from your own life. And, and that resonated very much because it has um, reminded me that whatever, whatever theory I'm writing, it's got to be grounded in some way. And when we talk about transformation and impact and living, um, you know, being in, inhabiting, um, in, inhabiting your work, it's, it's got to do the work of both. I mean, good academic research, I think, does the work of both. Um, yeah. The you know internal transformation as well as as well as the transformation of the work uh, yeah. of, of the of the community that you, in which you live. Yeah, I'm not trying to set them up oppositionally. I think um, I'm trying to think more integratively than that. But for me, um, for example, um, the grounding for my theory, I suppose, would draw on work drawing from sciences. It, it doesn't necessarily draw on my own personal journey, although inevitably my personal journey is intrinsically connected with everything that I do. I can't, I can't step outside of my own life or my own perspectives, but I'm, as you probably know from reading my work, I don't necessarily foreground my autobiographical personal journey in that theorization. And I hope I'm not mistranslating what you're saying there, Yoriko. I just think that there's, there's room for so much diversity of approach and modes of expression in, in what we do. And actually the more diverse our approaches and the more diverse our scholarship in a way, the better. Um, just to follow on a little bit from what Amaya mentioned about sort of unforeseen uses of our research. Uh, I, I think we do need to be more, more politically savvy and well-informed about all, all the different uses that are gonna be made and then be, you know, tactical about when and where and how much and all of that. But even so, there are going to be unforeseen uses. There are going to be uses that piss us off. But I don't think we can let that fear totally silence us. All we can do is sort of frame it in a way that we are helping the people that we care about as much as possible. But we cannot just shut up because people are also going to manipulate our data and research because that is also quite an effective tactic to get us to sort of paralyze, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's a, it's a fine line and I, I understand what you're talking about, Amaya, because I also have conducted research with migrant and refugee communities in, in North Africa. And so we have to be very careful about what we say, when we say it and where we say it and what people are going to use it for. But, you know, it's, sometimes you just have to take a chance because the benefits outweigh the, uh, <laughs> the bad uses, hopefully. Um, and we just have to get better at that calculation so that it's not too, you know, too awful. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right that that's an issue. You, know, you have to negotiate it. Yeah, interestingly, um, of many indigenous populations have created their own clearinghouse for working with academics, like the Zapatistas. It's like a two-year process. A lot of the um, Native Americans and have also have this vetting process that you have to you know, submit your proposal. So they've also become savvy in that point too, where they, they want to reduce their, their potential for exploitation. Yeah, and same with migrant and refugee communities, because they're sick of constantly being asked to attend these you know, <laughs> workshops. And then they're like, what have we gained from this after 10 years of this, you know, and it just seems nonsensical to them. So they just withhold because they realize that they have a lot of power. And then they just exercise that, which is fantastic, actually. And it makes knowledge production more, <laughs> you know, it improves the quality of what we produce. So it's, it's fantastic. Um, could I just jump in to uh, draw attention to what Loveday has mentioned earlier about teaching, because one of the questions we wanted to address today was um, for the early career researchers watching, who might be watching this um, live, live stream, we wanted to perhaps think about where that's going. Casualized teaching is an enormous problem in the UK. I don't know if that's the case in other uh, countries. It would be great to hear your experiences. And then also what we can do I mean, 
maybe what senior academics can do to support that um, or whether or not we need to all be pushing back against that um, and what other spaces we can create for uh, early career researchers to be able to, to feed themselves while they're establishing a career. Thanks. I suppose I asked, I asked a question because I would just wonder in my own, speaking from my own context and experience, how, how do we value the, the really important teaching aspect of our role when it actually comes, brings with it so little institutional respect and value? Um, and how, so how do we push back? I have more tools, I feel, for pushing back in the way that we've been discussing today in the areas of research and I've, Certainly, I think, given myself, given more thoughts that how do we push back against this casualization beyond, you know, from the for me, the, the clear answer is unionization. But in terms of institutionally, the, the, the deeper structural problems about the value we attach to teaching and the process of teaching, the Anissa raised the, I think she really threw down the gauntlet when she talked about the, the barriers even to, to, to young, um, the teenagers accessing. Um, education that, that we're taking for granted and I, I, I just don't have the answers and I'm, I'm I, ju I just have the questions. Maybe I, I can add something to that in terms of teaching um, I am I've been trying to say to construct this idea that comparative law is the new uh, way in which the civilizing mission has been done in Latin America. I mean, I'm a lawyer, I'm a law professor, so uh, I tend to, and I'm an indigenous person as well, so I tend to see with a lot of suspicion this idea of be compared with. And in Chile, because we have this neoliberal lab, right? The comparison comes always from the north. As I see the problem is in the south, but the, the perfect solution always is in the north because they know better. And we have this kind of natural paradigm, this, which is Spain, which is the empire. <laughs> we are a colony because we were made a colony by Spain and Spain continued to be the perfect example, the perfect solution. And I'm like I'm, I'm, I'm rebelling against this. And then I think that the way in which comparative law has been used is a civilizing mission. And we do not see, for example, Latin America as our, our natural parameter. For example, now we are in a constituent moment. We are drafting a new constitution. And I, I tell everyone over and over again, our comparison must come from Latin America. We have so much to learn from Ecuador, from Peru, from Bolivia, from Colombia. And people see it like, oh, no, the example, the parameter, the perfect constitution comes from Canada, from the US, from the US, come on, uh, from Europe. I mean, <laughs> why would you think otherwise? I mean, in which world do we live? So. If this is the new civilizing mission and I'm kind of fighting back, that, that will be my... <laughs> and in the classroom, I feel like the way to do that is obviously the syllabus, just who, who it is they're reading and make them read, you know, other Latin American scholars and, and don't give them <laughs> the other text. And, um, you know, and then it's hard to do that because of course there are less options. You really have to look, but I mean, the equivalent of that in the Middle East that I've, had to do and but you know we can try and we can make it and then in the dynamics in the classroom who you know set up a set of rules so that the same people are not always talking including the professor of course but also the students and to make sure that the women and people from different economic backgrounds scholarship students all everyone feels and that actually it's weighted towards them that we have more to learn from hearing from their experiences their knowledge than others and so there you know, this is i think love day's question is really important and we we actually have been talking about this in different forums as well about how to and i hesitate to call it decolonize academia because i don't like using the word decolonization in that context other you know because decolonization has a more specific meaning a more precise meaning than that but to make teaching um 
you know, less of a reproduction of the harms that we've been critiquing in research. Um, you know, there, there are techniques um, in terms of how to organize and even how to arrange the seats in the classroom and all, you know, all kinds of things. Um, not a perfect solution, but moves in the right direction within a structure that has massive problems. I mean, I also have more questions than answers. Yeah. And also, oh, it'd be nice oh, to hear from some of the audience as well, because I feel mm. like we've been talking a lot. I was going to say, Usha, your um, your comment that that we shouldn't we should make sure the the same people aren't always talking uh, prompts me to open up to the floor. <laughs> so, yeah, would I'd, we'd love to hear your comments and, and and questions. Please just jump in. Hi, hi, nice to meet you for this uh, meeting and this uh, webinar. It's really awesome what you're talking about. Um, I'm really uh, in with what all the speakers have been talking about, and. Uh, I'm very grateful for this. Uh, I work from Spain and uh, I work in the field of uh, horse human relationships and equine assisted activities and therapies. And especially in Spain, we have this uh, now not very nice situation because uh, this, before COVID 19, we were both hold on a pseudo therapies list. So, all different pro pro uh, volunteer professionals from uh, equine assisted interactions have joined to uh, build up a international cl uh, clinical trial in equine, th equine assisted therapies and uh, adult pa patient with arthritis. And we are building up this no, to uh, uh, put up the, the, the scientific evidence with the necessary rigor rigorosity. And that for one, for one part. Also, uh, from this COVID situation, uh, I feel that uh, at least in my field and in the outdoor education and uh, learning process and equine horse human relationship, um, we have uh, a great opportunity like to, 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 to offer this uh, sustainable and uh, healthy uh, interactions assisted with animals or with horses, but that you can learn lots of things. And I think it's what I think you, uh, I think it was Amaya, she was talking about this uh, necessity that you have to try to put your place where, um, so the audience doesn't think that you are like crazy one, like doing some research and um, yes, but really because I, I feel that for a long time ago, I had this, this feeling of, uh, you're working with horses like feel less, but it's really uh, there's there's very need to uh, important need to to put this scientific and this uh, research in the in in paper and, and bring it to to just not the scientific uh, um, academia or like the scientist language, but put it also to like the um, whole society like the indigenous and like everyone, try to, without uh, l losing this um, scientific rigorosity and scientific method, but given this information, like to, like a uh, 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 person that all work, is working in a grocery store or uh, driving a truck or whatever, like offer this, this opportunity, because I think uh, this research for me, it's at least, uh, it's not just doing some like research project, like very uh, scientific. This it's putting uh, information and putting uh, data that it's scientifically based and it's uh, affordable for all the people that can help them. No, I think so. I'm very thank you for this opportunity. I don't know yeah, thank you, Carlos. Um, and I, th I think, I mean, following on from your comments, it really does open up an opportunity for us to think of, think about how we can creatively work together with other people in society, you know, artists, um, yeah. museum curators, journalists, to, to be able to translate our, our work for a wider audience. Um, and, and this, um, I think at its best, and I know that you, you're very critical of, of the, the language of impact in, in UK academia, but at its best, that is what impact envisages. Um, 
the the trick I, I suppose as a researcher is not to become overly focused on the metrics that the university uses and and you know grades you against and to focus instead on what the community wants um, uh, and if we if we could maybe turn back to talking about teaching a little I I, I recognize one person in the audience um, Ivana I was wondering I know that you've yeah I know that you've you've taught in, in many different countries and I was wondering if if you might if, we, if you'd mind sharing with us um, some thoughts about how how that's taking place what the situation is for young researchers around the world well thank you so much thanks thanks everyone it I really enjoy listening to your it's just terrific to to hear it to, and, and thank you so much for being so generous to share your thoughts because that's also um, something that I feel is more and more kind of um, is not the norm anymore. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. So as Eureka said, I um, I've worked and taught in France, Germany, Italy. Uh, Belgium, Canada, the United States. Um, and now I am assistant professor at uh, Amsterdam University. Um, and I was just thinking, listening to you, uh, and especially to what Amaya and Anna said, and while I do think that there is um, what Amaya said, a civilizing mission going on through comparative law, even though I'm a comparative lawyer, uh, and I do think there is such a thing as a neoliberal corporate um, university. I also do think that it plays out differently in different contexts. So Amaya, when you, talk, when you talked about the global north, I was actually thinking, are we just talking about U the US, Canada and the UK? Because there are a lot of places in say Europe that are completely isolated from different reasons from the, the academic world that we're talking about, right? Um, and within Europe as well, we have huge discrepancies. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching, you know, EU class first, master, master mandatory class. I have 140 students. They're all very different. They're not all Dutch. They've, they come from all over Europe which means that there is some sort of quote unquote capacity building going on. They don't, we're not on the same page all the time. <laughs> so, so I was just thinking, um, you know, when we say global, global North, what do we actually, actually mean? And then what does that mean in our everyday life? Like sort of if we go now from all of these goals that I very much believe in transformative practice to the kind of nitty gritty of everyday practices. Well, what does that mean, right? And so you all mentioned publishing, Usha mentioned, uh, you know, refrain from publishing in this or that publication, go for, for, for a different one. Uh, you've all mentioned ways, but um, that, that's something that I've been thinking of a lot about and I, I I have an interdisciplinary and critical background and and kind of my way of dealing with that you know how to translate these sort of big words of transformative practice into my everyday life is well you change your teaching you change the curriculum you change every single space of kind of pocket of power that you have you invest in it and and that's hard. And and for all the reasons that you that you mentioned, I'm not gonna not gonna go into that. But um, it's it's it it it's hard. There's a lot of like thinking involved. How do I do that? When do I do that? But there is a commitment of investing in you know every single every single platform that I have and that I can have. And one thing that I also wanted to add, because Yuriko and Usha have known each other for 10 years, and most of my ideas also come from, you know, hours of conversation, hours and hours of, you know, conversation with, with them. Um, I, I do think that, you know, early career scholars are not powerless. So we shouldn't, and that's something that, again, I'm trying to, I've, I've been trying to do in my work. I'm trying to do that. Um, you know, we can, we can build networks. 
we don't have to wait for a mentor to help us build something. But then the question is, why is it that so many of us can do that? So you mentioned, yes, precarious jobs. Yes, that's, that's a reality. People cannot feed themselves, let alone, alone, alone build something. But, but that doesn't necessarily ref reflect every situation, right? I mean, this is not the, 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 the situation of every single early career scholar. And sometimes I came to think that sometimes people do not know, to put it bluntly, do not know better. So I was privileged enough to meet Yuriko and Usha when I was a first P year PhD student 10 years ago. So I could learn and I could learn from others and I could see different practices. But many people have never seen anything different. All they know is competition, hierarchy, authoritarian authority and kind of almost authoritarian like arguments i'm right because um so anyways these are just my thoughts because you i mean it's it's such a you know it's a, such a wonderful you know so many wonderful things that you've said but since your recall called my name i was like okay i'll just i'll just participate a little <laughs> but thank you so much i think thank you very much about uh, what you were saying about it, I think this really starts with a try, yes. Uh, you have to try. If you think that you feel that you have something and you can share it and you and something is important, I think it's just has, you have to try it. And then value and how to uh, balance so it's really worth it. At least in my experience, we have make up a virtual conference and everything. I think it's, okay, this... Let's try this webinars. Let's try these Zoom things. Let's try uh, Instagram. Let's try these things. Let's try this all these uh, tools that technology profits, and just try. And then, okay, maybe Zoom mm, uh, is better than Meet, or maybe Meet is better than Zoom. Or and then you you value and you balance. Thank you. Um, I think Amaya, you wanted to jump in too uh, in response to to Ivana. Just to say, hi, Ivana, nice to see you. Uh, just to say, um, wh when I take a critical stand on competitive law, it, I'm, I'm just um, pushing, I, I'm just trying to say that it's a power struggle. So you take an example that is so far away that you make it seem as neutral, as um, contacts-free, powerful, trendy. I find it that they look for trendy topics. But because they don't want to give enough context to say that our problem is shared by so many others in our region. So, for example, if you want to talk, talk about indigenous people, they will talk about New Zealand. They don't know anything about it, but it's so far away that it's, it's not harmful. Because if you talk about Bolivia, which is next to Chile, and you see the Bolivian constitution, you need to get more seriously about it. But New Zealand is kind of a trendy example, not, not close enough to be a kind of, a, I don't know, a kind of mandatory to take the, the change. You just seem like beautiful, but exotic. That, that's the, the, the word, like exotic, like Orientalism, right? Like something very... I was just thinking that a lot of us met through these sort of very elite institutions <laughs> and the opportunities that that has given us, because obviously, Ivana, you didn't just learn from us, we learned a lot from you as well. And the reason why all of us were able to come together was through, you know, extremely elite Ivy League um, places and professors that had, you know, enough funding to, to do that and chose to use it in a way that they knew would be beneficial. So. I guess, I mean, you know, beneficial to them as well, but also beneficial to, to us. And um, I think that, you know, as Ivana was saying, you know, there are people who will never have that opportunity who will miss out. Um, but those who have not, well, then we have a responsibility to remember all the other people from Eastern Europe, from the Middle East, from North Africa, from Africa, who did not get to go to those things and did not get to meet people who set them a good example 
and help them to not be afraid and help them to prepare for a difficult life in academia <laughs> for as long as they can survive in there. Because like Love Day was saying, if you engage with these things, the daily toll is fairly immense. <laughs> the strain on your body and your mind is, is, a, is, is a lot and your friends are necessary to, to, to survive. Um, the only other thing I was going to say in response to what Ivana was saying is that um, I think uh, Anissa was saying that, you know, these class issues are so important and they cut across the north and south. And so you have elites all over the world that behave in very similar <laughs> exploitative ways. Um, and you have the masses all over the world that are increasingly facing similar problems. And certainly you see that within Europe. And the, the interesting thing is that actually, to a certain extent, that was always the case. It was even the case you know, during European empire um, that the laboring classes were sort of, <laughs> you know, not only being used in similar ways, but were pitted against each other so they could not achieve solidarity. <laughs> so a lot of things haven't changed that much. And, you know, the fact that we didn't notice um, is, is, is constructed and we're not meant to. Um, I still think that it's useful to talk about global north and global south, even though where that is, <laughs> you know, who, you know the, it's a transnational play. Um, but the reason we still need to talk about it is because that was constructed by, you know, by Europe and Europe has set up most of the disciplines, all of the disciplines we work in, every single field of knowledge production is structured by those, that history and that, those, their philosophies. And they made these distinctions. And if we want to break them down, obviously we need to <laughs> deal with the fact that um, we didn't make them. We need to yeah, just jump in real quick. No, I completely agree with you. I'm not opposed to using Global South and Global North North at all. That's not what I'm saying. The only thing that I'm saying is that contexts are so different. Working in Germany is different from working in Belgium, is different from working in Amsterdam, is working. For, so it, it how these how the dynamics that we talked about, class, neoliberalism, play out on the ground, it, it, it really is different from, you know, from, from context to context. And so what this made me think that, you know, one needs to also kind of be aware of these differences in order to make, to make a change, to make a ch change that will, that will matter, right? So, so that's the only thing that I'm saying. So I'm not kind of saying, oh, these words, we should not be using them to understand what is saying, what, 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 what is, what is going on. What I'm saying is that we also need to pay attention to the diversity that exists. So within the global North, but all pockets of the global quote unquote South in the global North, like we, we, we need to take that into, into, into consideration when then designing the strategy that will, you know, deliver whatever we want to, you know, see happen. So, so yeah, you know, but I, I completely agree with you, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to bring that that up. You know, most of my research focuses on how pockets of the global south are within the global north, and this is what's creating this friction and this tension. And it's really addressed by, by this theory called border theory. I grew up in a pocket of the global south in the in the north. And there's and you know, when when I was you know, I was fortunate enough to go to Stanford for graduate school. So you know, like, as, as you said, it brings it it allows you to exist in many different spaces. But I also think that when when we think about these these issues, we need to expand our geographic imaginations that Edward Soja has pointed out, that we're not just in one place. And why I chose to work in migration is because migrants, immigrants are living in multiple spaces. They're functioning within margins. Mm -hmm. And as we look to, you know, we're always telling in the global north, the global south to modernize, but we really don't reflect on what modernity means. They actually are one because the whole colonial process was modernization. And when I look at the two, you know, Stanford and USF, from a teaching perspective, the institution really provides what pedagogical approach you're going to use. 
at Stanford, I didn't have a, a lot of wiggle room into you know, what I was going to talk about. Um, there wasn't that institutional support. Uh, you know, I, was, I was talking uh, uh, you know, about, about things that were relevant to my community. And they really weren't, there, there weren't professors to work with. There weren't advisors. And now again, USF is a very different institution in that they bring in on purpose by design researchers from the global south. That's what we read. This is the majority of the people we read. Yes, we read uh, also, you know, scholars from the global north. So we understand, you know, what are what are the what are both sides saying, and both are you know to some extent relevant. And they bring in these scholars then into our classes, and to engage with those scholars. So I mean, that's also another another approach that one we can we can bring is inviting your students to engage in research that would and being the advisors for for those projects um, so that that's that's one one perspective thank but you yeah, it's, it's going to be um, really seeing things differently yeah when we're talking about global north and global south if if i could just add um the I always wonder where Asia fits into this, East Asia, because I'm from Japan and we never in these conversations about decolonizing the curriculum or, or um, Black Lives Matter or, or global, global, or global South conversations, we never talk about the place of East Asia, um, particularly China, where in the UK, most of our students come from. Um, and I know that within the GRN, we have great trouble communicating with our members who are in China because they don't have access to the same platforms that we do, or we don't have access to the platforms they do. Um, and so that is something to, to not forget when we're doing our research, trying to reach out to collaborate with, with you know, to, to create really, really, truly diverse academic teams, research teams, and also when we're teaching. So in the content that, we're, that we include. Um, uh, Amaya, I know that you've got something to say. Yeah. I wonder whether I could also um, flag that Olatz um, has a question about accessibility and diversity and teaching content. Um, Amaya, do you want to quickly jump in and then and then Olatz? Thank you. Uh, uh, I would just say that maybe um, we need to have some kind of guidance or principles in mind and move from that. For example, you just said we diversity in the in the classroom and then I was teaching about human dignity in class and I made an effort to search for research that have done work on human dignity from and Southeast Asian perspective, and it was so interesting. It was wonderful. Even there's this book about P.C. Chang, one of the drafters of the um, Universal Human Rights Declaration that came from China and all his perspective from Hans Roth, which is a Sweden professor. And, and it was wonderful to see how many of the ideas of Confucianism was a part of this declaration. And it made me realize that maybe I didn't have had enough uh, time and work to go for this diversity in authors and publications to make to make it part of the classroom. So it's all, all, also our responsibility to look for those materials because they are most probably out there, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Olatz, I don't know if you're still there. Mm. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if there was any advice that I could get regarding how to include into the researcher when researching on a topic um, more diverse uh, points of view, especially since the accessibility, accessibility issue has been mentioned. I'm still a very early researcher. I just graduated and I am currently doing the master a master uh, by the Pompeu Fabra, the master in power, media and difference. And I'm just starting to learn more about uh, inclusivity and how to actually, uh, when researching about the topic, not just considering the topic, but also the perspective of the other, uh, the other, the so-called other uh, when addressing the issue. So yeah, I was basically wondering if there's any resource, any kind of, you know, of course, any, 
any place to research, like the platforms that are ResearchGate, uh, Google Scholar, any, um, any way to access more diverse stories or to amplify uh, so that when researching on a topic, I can actually access to more than the big names for the first 50 pages that appear on Google Scholar, but directly being able to see more um, other perspectives and not just the one that have access to publishing in big journals and for, with big names supporting of universities. Well, I guess if I combine that with what Amaya just said, there isn't an easy way. <laughs> you have to put in a lot more effort and put in the time. And if, if you know, make the decision, if that's worth it for you, which a lot of people just decide it's not or just simply don't have the time and effort to do that. Um, but yeah, it is, it is harder. And, and um, one way to at least um, conduct research accurately is to say, well, if I'm writing about, you know, migrants and refugees, for instance, or Indigenous people, and then I've got no documents, nothing written by those people, <laughs> then um, obviously we have to begin by acknowledging that any research we do is likely not to be that accurate. Um, and, and that at least is a start, <laughs> you know. If you look at international refugee and migration law, I'm an international lawyer, nothing written by people that those laws actually affect so that's why those laws are so completely irrelevant and out of touch and so if that's all you can say then, then that's all you can say you know <laughs> and then if you want to be able to say more than that then yeah you got to learn another language most of those things are not online and the reason why east asian <laughs> research is harder to connect with is because there is no incentive for them to do that in english you know, because that disconnects them from the communities they're actually working with. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just exactly what Amaya was saying. Why, why should I write in English when the people I need to talk to don't speak English? And that's happening in China for sure. They are a big enough network that they don't need us. And why would they? And we're the ones that miss out. <laughs> you know? um, I, think, yeah. I think you've touched on something that here at Jaren we can actually help with with the um, maybe maybe having more more book talks and highlighting authors that um, are from the global south or have a different perspective uh, if you're interested you can you know, send me a, a message and i can send you the curriculum uh, that that we use at usf and it's very heavily weighted towards diversity of, of thought and people that are working in the global south or have worked in the global south. So maybe that's an idea like, you know, to make it easier for academics to find these types of resources. That's wonderful. Thank you, Anissa. Um, now we're rapidly running out of time. So I think um, to, to close this wonderful conversation, I would like to ask each of our panelists um, for one thought, one outstanding maybe thought to go forward with um, for early career researchers going into a, 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 a lifetime of hardship, <laughs> going into <laughs> and you know embarking on an exciting journey of teaching and research, um, maybe some advice on 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 what they can start doing today. Uh, Anissa, would you like to start? Let's see. Let's see. Hmm. I think for myself, I can say for myself, what drives me and what can what what keeps me doing this is passion. Uh, really find a area that you're passionate about. That you, you you know we, you can't change everything in the world, but you can change your little your little part of of the globe. So you know, pick something that that you really feel, I, I want to do this. This is my calling in life. That's almost a gift to find your calling in life. For, for me, it, it, it happened to be refugees and asylum seekers. So that, that I think that will keep you, will keep your, your, your engines going if you find that passion, you find that area. Thank you. Uh, and Anna? Yeah, I was going to say follow your passion too. Um, I think passion has to be 
driving force of our lives generally as human beings and especially as academics. But I would add to that, find your tribe, um, follow your passion and find people who feed you in terms of your research passion, your intellectual development, your personal development, and possibly to add that to maybe get a couple of mentors, certainly one within your institution, someone who you trust, who can have your back, who can help you nav navigate um, institutional politics and stay sane and certainly someone in your field um, ideally someone who's um, really pressing the boundaries of thinking and who's been following their own passion and can ignite when co-ignite with your passion and really feed feed your development I think mentoring is key thank you love day I think I'm prepared to swim against the tide if you want to yeah, find your own way and to make a difference. The, I think there's a great weight that comes down to bear instantly when you start working in academia of expectations that don't actually seem to match your own um, career aspirations or your own sense of purpose um, and your own passions um, about what it is that you want to achieve. So there will be numerous people telling you that then what you're doing is not worthwhile because it doesn't tick the, the right box in academia. So I, th I think just be, like I say, if, in whatever preparation you need in order to face that kind of sense that you're, what you're doing is still valuable, even though you're constantly getting the message that it isn't, then whether that's finding your tribe or just you know, swimming in cold water, whatever it is, find it and do it so that you can keep swimming. Thank you. Uh, and Usha? Um, I would say create a network of support that's transnational. And I actually want to touch on something that Ivana brought up, which is really important, I think, because when you form such a network, you need to find commonalities so that you have an incentive to work together, but you need to do that in a non-hegemonic way so that each person in that network can still feel like they are in the center, that everyone is in the center, <laughs> you know, that, that, that you make room for the individualities, um, but in solidarity. And, and that, I mean, that has been done. It's, it's done in environmental justice movements, for instance, um, you know, where, or, or, or solidarity between people of color that, that, you know, it's challenging, but it's, it's doable. And I think that that is essential um, for an early career researcher uh, today. Um, and of course, I agree with what everyone has said before. I think that it's not really a struggle because we do come into this field because we enjoy doing what we do. So there is always something rewarding, no matter how bad things are, we know why we're doing this. And I think the pandemic has helped with that in a way because it has made people you know, figure out their priorities because they could die. <laughs> so that has made them figure out what matters to them. Um, and yeah, so, I would say it's not all doom and gloom by any means. There are things we can do together. Thanks, Usha. And Amaya. Thank you. Um, I was thinking um, that I will give us a final thought uh, to think whom you want to work with and for. Because as Ivana said, academia is powerful. Don't think for a minute that what you will publish won't have results. So be very thoughtful about whom you want to empower and why. And, and on the other hand, be humble too. If you see that you made a mistake or you didn't uh, hit the people you want to empower or you empower the wrong ones, be humble and just change. I mean, be open to change, be open to learn from others, from people you work with, because sometimes academics get so um, mainly males, but sometimes females too, <laughs> uh, become so, I don't know, full of themselves. So be humble. Uh, but your work is powerful. So empower the right people. Thank you so much, Amaya. And, and on that note, uh, thank you all. I'm really grateful to you for having come together and given up your precious time to have this extraordinary conversation. 
uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Um, I will will make a recording of this. We'll edit the recording and put it online so that others can continue watching it and, and to um, get new ideas. And we'll, we'll hopefully have a follow up to this at some point. So thank you. And thank you to the to the audience for coming and for watching. All right. Thank See you, you so later. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>